Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Um, we'll get started um, shortly. Um, today, I felt that it would be good to talk a little bit about uh, one of my favorite topics, which is how to be as efficient as possible, and specifically on how to be efficient uh, while being in a lab, which I think is a really important thing. Um, just as a prelude, I think that <clears throat> many scientists I know are spend their lots of time, um, lots of their lives in the lab. And unfortunately, many of them are not as effective and as efficient as they could be um, in terms of what they get accomplished. So, so I think this is a really important topic. I think um, it does separate um, the scientists to different categories that really effective ones wind up um, doing a lot of things that I think we're going to talk about here. <laughs> so um, the, one of the things I definitely like to do is get as much engagement um, and interaction today. I will um, try to keep things as informal as possible and not really give a lecture, but try to um, have a um, dialogue as much as possible and not, um, you know, um, make it as as casual as possible. So, so let's um, let's kind of get started. Uh, so, throughout the talk, if you have any questions or want to talk about anything specific, feel free to um, either raise your hand and I'll bring you up, and then you guys can um, ask your question yourself, or you can uh, type it in the chat box. And both of those um, in the Q and A, both of those should be possible. So I'll tell you, I guess I'll start off by talking about my own journey and what I learned along the way. Um, and uh, that will kind of hopefully get us a little bit um, in line about what I'm talking about. So I, I didn't really start research until fairly late in my kind of um, university career. I did do lab work, of course, um, as I went to chemical engineering at the University of Toronto. I did a lab work um, throughout my um, undergraduate, but I didn't really do independent research um, until the summer after my third year of university. Um, and I really uh, thought it was amazing, you know, being able to have a lab in which you can uh, do basically any scientific um, discovery or ask lots of different types of questions and be able to design experiments to address it. I thought it was, you know, one of the coolest things. Uh, but um, I, it, as some of you guys know, I always talk about it took me five years to publish my first paper um, after that. So it definitely was not an easy experience to learn how to become effective and efficient in a laboratory setting and then be able to um, generate data and be able to ask questions that could lead to publication. So this all took a long time for me. And it was a lot of it was through experiences of what not to do um, during that five years. Um, I learned quite a bit about um, a lot of aspects of that. So for me, um, I when I first started doing science, I definitely worked an incredible amount. I worked quite a bit in the lab. Um, I was, um, you know, one of those guys who loved uh, doing stuff in the lab and, you know, loved um, doing cell culture and, you know, playing with all kinds of different equipment and learning about them and learning about um, science, reading a lot of papers, um, all of those things. I did quite a lot of that. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the research lab, uh, both in my undergraduate and then I did my master's for two years at University of Toronto. Um, and then I went to uh, my PhD and only in the second year of my PhD, I published my first paper after literally five years of um, working um, um, on, on things. Um, and maybe it was even my third year of my PhD, I published my first paper. So, so this was all like a, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, work that didn't result in any real um, outcomes in terms of scientific publications. And I would, um, I would say I learned quite a bit about um, what to do. Um, and I, 
And I, as I went through this process, I actually didn't learn um, what to do until I actually had a mentor um, in uh, Bob Langer's lab at MIT, whose name is Cap Young So, who actually taught me how to be really efficient. So Cap Young, who um, uh, was a postdoc when I was in Bob's lab, um, was a really incredible PhD student uh, from Korea. He published like 20 papers in his um, um, and during his PhD, and he was um, really, really incredible in terms of being efficient. Um, what he did was basically everything he did, every experiment he did wound up being a figure on a publication that uh, he wound up having. And it was really um, incredible because um, here I was, I literally spent years and years um, doing experiments and I couldn't publish. And here he was, everything he did was a publication. So I learned quite a bit um, about how Kep Young did science and how he actually um, asked his questions and how he performed those experiments. So one of the things I can say is that, um, you know, Kep Young was really, um, you know, had a really a strong technology in a particular area. So he was a, very strong, he did develop this micro patterning technique. So he had a basis of uh, science that he could apply to different things. So I think that's probably the first thing that I would recommend having a strong basis in a particular area so that you actually have a very deep experience in something. Um, and then the other thing that he did was that he was able to apply that tool to a bunch of different types of questions. So his patterning approach, he applied it to um, proteins and then applied it to cells and applied it to viruses and applied it to lots of different types of um, outcomes. And you know, then he asked uh, more and more uh, detailed questions. Okay, what, what happens if we start having multiple cells that are patterned in a particular way? And you know, it was really, um, but it all came from that um, initial strength in a particular science that he could apply to different things. So I think it's important to have your own skill set. For me, when I learned um, to partner with Cap Young, I, I was more of the biological um, expert. I had done a lot of cell culture and playing with cells and characterizing them. And that actually allowed me to um, bring my skill set to work with Cap Young and together we formed a team. Um, the other thing that I, I can tell about that those periods is that I actually um, really learn how to work with other people in the lab and that actually increases efficiency quite a bit. So we had a team pretty much that worked together. Um, each of us um, brought in their own skill set um, and then we published a bunch of papers um, in which different people kind of took turns being um, the lead author, but all of us were uh, contributing uh, quite a bit. And, um, and it really made things faster. So it allowed us to kind of have this uh, speed um, to get things done. Um, the other thing about it was we actually um, did everything together. You know, this is um, something about writing a paper that's important. As we did experiments, we actually also worked on the write-up of those experiments. We really thought about what the subsequent experiments should be, how the figures of the, that paper would be as early as possible, what the story would be, what the title would be, what the outcome would be. We start writing the methods and materials early. You know, we, we worked on the entire paper um, all at the same time, as opposed to a very um, sequential step of getting all the data and then maybe writing a particular section and then another section, all that stuff. So it was a very um, seamless process and it almost to some degree, um, we did so much um, all at the same time that it, I didn't need to keep like all those lab notebooks that I did for the, my first five years of research, which never resulted in any publications. So I had like lots of lab notebooks, but no publications. But once I went to Cap Young, we were publishing so fast that it almost was, um, uh, you know, just the data went straight to papers. So which was um, 
another really interesting kind of uh, thing that I learned um, during that time. The other thing that I learned is kind of how to ask particular questions that actually are going to generate um, um, good outcomes, regardless of whether the experiment worked or not. So that's another thing. A lot of times when I was first um, in my earlier years, I kind of did the kind of experiments that would only work if there was a positive outcome. And a lot of times that there would not be a positive outcome because you know the thing just, let's say, if you're trying to differentiate a cell to a different cell, if you don't have that differentiation, then you can't really publish anything, right? Because your publication is based on a positive outcome. But, and I learned more and more about how to kind of ask questions that actually um, generated, the question what itself was interesting enough, not necessarily whether the answer was positive or negative. And that's another thing that I think I learned along the way that not rely on those positive outcomes um, as much so that you don't need a, um, the experiment to give you a, a, a particular data for you to say, I have some found something interesting. And I think that kind of also allows people to be more and more um, um, efficient um, as, as you go forward. You know, science is a lot of it is about asking the right questions. And to ask the right questions, you have to really know in an area well. Um, and that's where you need to kind of the whole specialization and being an expert um, comes in. So I definitely recommend that people who are interested in about um, being able to work really efficiently in the lab to focus on that question a lot as opposed to uh, pipetting because you can pipette a lot like what I did for five years and not ask the right question and then not be able to uh, publish um, a paper. So, so that's kind of like what I learned um, when I was with Cap Young and Cap Young, um, I spent the uh, two, three years with him, but it really changed my trajectory in developing and being able to effectively do experiments in the laboratory. And one of the other things, as I mentioned, working with other people I learned during that process was um, how you can actually uh, build your own team. Um, and I had a couple really incredible undergraduate students who worked with me when I was a graduate student who really got um, a lot of work done and enabled a lot of the experiments and worked on the things. Whereas I spent more of the time doing the, um, the typing and writing the papers and all that stuff. Whereas physically they helped a lot in the actual experiments. And that was another way I could uh, speed up what I do. Um, now, I don't necessarily recommend that for everyone. I think you first need to really know what you're doing before you actually have a team. And I had done five years of research um, to kind of purely in the lab. So I knew what I was doing in the lab. And what my weakness was, was to really uh, focus on the writing and the the story development and um, the paper uh, development aspect. And that's what I focused on during my PhD. And um, um, my two undergraduates really helped me with the experiments so I can focus on the other parts. Um, so later on, so that's kind of um, took me through my graduate um, days. Um, and then later on, I as I kind of graduated and became a professor, there's a whole additional level of uh, learning to be efficient, which is um, at a whole different level. Because as an early professor, you don't necessarily um, get to be in the lab anymore. Um, so, but um, you have to actually do a lot of other types of science. You have to focus a lot more on idea development and understanding what are the trends and what are the things around the corner that's going to be important. And more and more, I started kind of focusing on that as I went along in my, in my career. And um, over there, there's a whole different, different set of um, things that are needed to be efficient. Obviously, you have to still be able to develop great teams, work with collaborators that are bringing additional tool sets to uh, what you have. Um, also be able to motivate your own team, uh, whether those are uh, postdocs or graduate students, 
and then um, try to protect your time as much as possible. Um, don't do things that are going to be a waste of time um, and um, try to start identifying what is going to be um, a good thing or a, or a bad thing to do and how you can kind of uh, focus on things that are going to be um, bringing in the um, uh, bringing in the things that are going to get uh, valued at least at different stages of your career, whether that's early on, it could be getting grants or publications later on, it could be you know, I don't know, submitting a patent or, or starting a company, or those are all the other things that um, at different stages matter. And I think being able to really um, think about those and develop um, the right um, ability to make the decisions, whether you're going to do something or not do something um, and choose the right uh, forks in the pad, um, path, it becomes uh, really interesting. So maybe... Um, um, also, I'll kind of stop there and uh, ask people to start asking questions. I know typically we have a lot of questions that um, uh, we typically do not get time to go through. So I definitely want people to um, have as much time to ask questions about their own habits and their own um, kind of um, questions that they have about how to be efficient. But um, but one of the things that I can tell for sure is that um, most people that I've met have actually had, a, this has been a big challenge for them. Being able to really work effectively and efficiently um, is really um, what I think separates the people. And I can tell like we have great postdocs in the lab. Uh, perhaps some of them are uh, listening to this. And I always tell people that um, if you, if you actually just kind of um, focus a lot more on what is the outcome that you're trying to get and, you know, set high goals, like, you know, ex, you know, expect that you can do a lot better than let's say one paper or two papers a year, you should, you can do potentially 10 papers a year. And if you set that goal and then you uh, say, okay, how do I actually get there? Then over time, I think that, you start seeing how you can increase your efficiency and becoming uh, become uh, better and better every day. Um, so just some general tools that I would also recommend people um, use if, as if they're trying to get more and more efficient um, in doing things. One of them is um, definitely set a time for every task that you want to do. Don't go into something with an unlimited time because that task will take unlimited amount of time to do. Um, and if you think something is work is can be done in like two hours, then try to really push yourself and see if you can get the same quality done in an hour. Try to save an hour of your time um, uh, if by just making sure that you learn what you need to do to get that thing done effectively and efficiently. And if um, and then look back and look say, okay, what is it that I could have done differently to um, get this done more effectively. So those are, you know, one of the things that I tell people is that if what you're doing yesterday is the same as what you're going to do today and same as what you're going to do tomorrow, then by definition, you're not really improving. You have to continue iterating through processes, changing things, and then seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, and that I think is really, really uh, important. So I have some questions that are uh, coming in. We can kind of start going through some of them. Um, so there's a question about um, if you, have, as you're trying to become an independent researcher, how do you work around situations where your question that interests you doesn't align with your mentor or your PI? So um, I would say that ideally, you know, your question should align with your mentor or PI, but obviously there are you know, there are always restrictions, right? So we're all kind of um, have to get funding from particular places. So sometimes where you're getting funded is uh, is basically, is, is based on a question that may not be your main interest. So to me, the way to address that is, first of all, like you have to, you always have to have a portfolio of things that you're doing. It's, it's gonna be very difficult to just do everything with just um, um, just focus on just one thing, 
for a long period of time and be successful. So I think you definitely need to always think of your um, how you spend your time as an investment. And if you have investments in many different things and you have chosen those investments properly, then and you kind of mature them, then you can actually uh, make sure you benefit a lot. But if you just have everything in one thing, then it's hard to make sure that that's going to be successful. So a lot of times when um, when we're doing projects, there's a main project that um, that's kind of what we call pays the bills. It's what the grant is about. But then you can have lots of side projects. And if you're effective and efficient, you can actually get things done um, and not always have like 50 projects that are not getting done. So um, so, so you could make some, some of your side projects, the kind of projects that aligns with your own scientific interests and questions, uh, but at the same time, do the kind of stuff that pays the bills so that, you know, your mentor or PI is also happy and says that, yes, we're, you know, we're getting the work done. And, you know, when I have to send a report to our, um, to our funding agency, then I, this is the work that we can present to that. But at the same time, we can have other publications and other areas that are interesting. So I think it's a really a portfolio uh, approach that uh, one should do. Um, another question is, Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. So you finish the experiments um, and you wind down the project and you have enough for a whole manuscript, but you haven't really written the paper. And then you go to a different thing, whether that's another group or position, and then you get you know, focused on different things and it becomes very difficult to ever finish that uh, manuscript. So, so that's you know, very true. A um, lot of people kind of um, do that. I've, you know, I can tell you that as a PI, I experienced uh, many, many um, individuals who've gone through that, who didn't finish their papers out of the group and then almost never finished them. And I would always say uh, there is a graveyard of papers for every paper I publish. There is a few other ones that we never published, and some of them are exactly like that. So I, you know, my advice is you should not let papers go till you leave the group. Um, you know, in an ideal situation, you write the paper as you do the experiments, and there is um, not just collect a lot of data. You do the experiments that are going to lead to figures, and as you're doing those experiments, you write the paper, different sections of the paper, and you try to finish everything super fast. So, so that's kind of my advice. Um, there's really, it's really difficult to do, to go back and try to uh, do the manuscripts that you did the experiments for like years ago. So uh, my advice is never be in that situation um, in general. So I know it's difficult, but I think if we learn to be efficient, um, then I think that would be um, helpful there. Um, So, so there's a question about how to say no to a PI or a supervisor for projects that are predictable or known to, um, to have not a very productive outcome or become distracting to your focus. So um, I would say that you probably first want to make sure that you um, know that that project is actually not going to be very... Um, um, positive or productive. A lot of times PIs do know what they're talking about and uh, maybe they, they are, there's a reason they're asking you to do that project. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of times there's other um, things like there is a funding source that we have to have um, data for. So, so my advice is to talk to your PI as much as possible and understand why, what is the reason that project should be done and why is it important? Um, you know, and if it really is not an important project or it doesn't need to be done, then a lot of times the PI themselves say, okay, you know, let's focus on something different. You know, these things should really be mutually uh, decided on. Um, I think um, the issues happen when it's like a unilateral decision, like, you know, either 
the PI wants it done or the student wants it done and then it's not clear to the whole team. So I think just a lot of communication in that case is uh, super important. Um, so there's a question about, you know, what do you do when you work, work um, with the team and you don't get credited appropriately in the paper? Um, you know, and that's, um, you know, there, that's an interesting question because a lot of times like the, the biggest issues in labs are related to, uh, um, you know, how much credit is assigned to which person, where people are on the authorship list and all of that stuff. My general advice is, um, you know, try to have such a big pie that you don't really care about, you know, um, if other people are eating from the pie. Um, so that's, you know, growing the pie is the biggest th advice I can give. So if you have lots of papers that are coming out and you're, you're doing a lot of different things, um, then it almost doesn't matter. I've had tons of situations where, you know, I didn't feel comfortable in the, about how I was credited or treated in a particular situation, but um, I can all, almost like always just say, forget about it because I can move on. Um, and be more successful if I don't spend my time worrying about this. So that's kind of my general advice. Just um, if you're really efficient and effective um, in what you're doing, then um, you'll get so much stuff done that you never have to worry about credit. And in fact, people will be drawn to you because you um, everything you touch turns into gold and people want to be associated with that. Um, so that's kind of, I think, what how I would go about it, just kind of focus on your, what you can control, which is your efficiency, um, um, as opposed to what you can't control, which is how other people are thinking. Um, so the, the question is, before knowing the full story of an article, how do you start writing the article? Um, I would say you shouldn't start writing the article before you know the full story. You know, the full story um, should be almost, one of the things that you can determine pretty quickly when you start doing the experiments. You know, if you start doing an experiment and looks like there's some data that starts looking interesting, then the full story of your publication should emerge in front of you. And that's the whole concept of writing an outline, which is um, you do it very early on in the whole scientific process. Um, and that determines what the story of the publication will be and um, to a lot of degree determines even what the figures will be. So I, I think I did a fireside chat on um, how to write papers a while back. So I definitely refer people to that um, because I have a lot of discussions about outlines and being able to, um, to actually go through and come up with, how do we come up with a story? Um, so I think that's really gonna be important. So, so that's my advice, just make sure you know the story before you start writing. <clears throat> So this is the question um, is about, um, can we, so I mentioned this thing about doing the kind of experiments that do not require a positive outcome, um, but whatever outcome you get, it could be interesting. And whether I can think of examples of that. So, so I would say, um, so here's, here's some things I would think about. Um, so if you're just kind of trying to, let's say, make a uh, skin tissue and you're doing, um, you know, you're doing cell culture of skin cells and, you know, you're just basically, your end goal is to make a skin tissue um, and you just try different approaches and you do not get a skin tissue then you have failed. But if you're, as you're doing those different approaches, then you change a parameter. Let's say you change um, like the mechanical stiffness of your substrate. Then independent of whether you make a skin tissue, the effect that you see with changing the mechanics itself is gonna be interesting because you can say on skin cells, we change the mechanics from this range to that range. And we saw a particular um, outcome 
that is um, basically, um, you know, in this stiffness, this was the outcome, the cells behaved this way, in the other stiffness, the cells behaved in a different way. So it doesn't necessarily depend on you getting the one positive outcome, which is a skin that looks like a skin and behaves like a skin. Actually, the intermediate steps over there are all kind of um, positive outcomes as well. So that's kind of one example. And while I'm kind of talking about that, one of the things that I didn't really talk about is actually how to design the individual experiments. You know, it's amazing how many times people do experiments and they're not really understanding what is the parameter that you're changing and what are the parameters that you keep constant and what is the range of those parameters that you're changing. So these are, you know, I think, um, again, really, really important things If people are not doing that. Um, you're basically are setting yourself up for failure. Um, you have to be able to design experiments properly. And a lot of it has to do with understanding what is the parameter that is your, um, that needs to be changed and how can you actually design an experiment in which you get an um, interesting outcome. So a really good question. Um, So there's a question about um, um, postdoc experience and um, which is kind of uh, experience that is um, about dependency and independence and it can be tricky. So um, general things about postdoc, I guess, you know, we did have this postdoc fireside chat last week. So definitely encourage people to look at that, but um, Postdoc, as, as uh, I mentioned, is about a um, few things. One is trying to get your scientific maturity up to the level where you can be fully independent scientists. So by definition, is something that is a, still a training um, experience. So you are getting trained to become an independent scientist with a broader skill set than a PhD student. Um, and um, so, so it is going that fine line between being an independent and dependent, but the goal of it is to continue improving throughout your postdoc. And what you come out on the other side is basically um, being ready to ask important questions and having the skills to, to write um, persuasively, to uh, be able to describe um, ideas clearly and get people to buy into those ideas and kind of spend time on them. So that's kind of what I think the postdoc is about. Um, and, and I think it is by definition that whole line between dependence, um, dependency and independence. Um, so how do we build a good team? Um, so I, I think, you know, with a good team, ideally you want to work with people that um, are friends and good people that you like to interact with because it makes um, working on things so much easier. Um, and then the other thing is that you have to bring different skill sets to the table. Um, I think that's going to be really important. If everyone has the same way of thinking, then it makes it more difficult to um, really see the different contributions that people are uh, bringing to the table. So. Um, so those are a couple of advice. And working with really good people, I think, is important. If you're working with um, top people, then um, you learn a lot from them as well. It's just not about just their science, but how they even do different things. So I think being able to work with um, really top people um, who have different uh, backgrounds is, is very important. Uh, there's a question about how to remain motivated. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, the general thing about being motivated is that you have to love what you're doing. Um, if you don't love what you're doing, then it's work. And if it's work, then it's hard to be motivated all the time. So, you know, everyone goes through different ups and downs, um, but it's really important that, um, you know, you kind of first understand that what you're doing is something that you're passionate about you know, you are a zealot for, you are a you know, person who's very energetic about that whole initiative. Um, and, um, and then, you know, you go through your ups and downs and your motivation at some point is, 
you know, a little bit lower, a little bit higher at other times, uh, but you're always moving towards that ultimate direction that you, you know, you, you, you see yourself at it and you see is, is related to your ultimate goal and ultimate passion and all those other things. So, so, so it's a, it's a whole challenge about this whole uh, um, being able to be passionate and to be able to persevere, um, which is kind of leads to that characteristic grit um, um, that I talked about in one of my earliest um, fireside chats about success. So I think that's also, yeah, um, another thing I would recommend. Um, so there's a question about how do you um, basically, any suggestions I have for people who want to start managing multiple projects and people? Um, I would say the most important thing about managing multiple projects and people is to focus on finishing things. Because if you're not finishing things, you can work um, and manage multiple projects and people forever and not have any outcome. So it's really important that people learn to finish things um, and focus on finishing at all times. And then, um, you know, try to also synergize um, between the different projects and people. If their same techniques are needed in multiple different um, projects, then be able to use that as an advantage. If the same um, um, person can help in different ways, use that. So synergizing also is another thing that I would recommend uh, doing. Uh, but yeah, finishing is really important because that's what a lot of people don't do properly, which is causes a lot of inefficiencies. Um, there's a question about experiment design. If we try to incorporate a novel idea from another research in our project, um, can we design experiments efficiently while we may not have all the necessary knowledge? And then how do we, um, how do we work our met methodology um, to make sure that we're on the right track? So I think um, you definitely always have to kind of expand your tool set. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do it in vacuum. Like I would have just get into areas in which you have, you, you yourself don't have any experience and you have no um, support system around you that could generate or give you that experience. I would try to kind of pick my questions and um, pick, pick my answers um, in a way that I can actually accomplish them in a reasonable time. And if, if, I can't, then I would say that's probably may not be a question that I should go after because, you know, it, at this point, I don't have the right skill set to answer it. So, but as you pick up different things or have different collaborators, then I think you can start bringing in those tools to your um, um, questions. Um, There's a question about tissue engineering um, and linking and how um, the industry is maturing, but not necessarily fully mature yet. Um, and, um, and, you know, what I basically think about that, I think, you know, if you got a PhD in, in tissue engineering, um, you know, really PhD gives you a lot of skill sets um, and ability to do research. Um, so you can do um, research in many different uh, fields from a PhD in tissue engineering, may not necessarily be tissue engineering, but um, it may be related to biomedical devices. It may be related to um, um, cell manufacturing. It may be related to um, lots of other things. So I think that's how one should think about their PhD. It's really difficult to find um, a job that's kind of designed for your PhD sometimes. Um, so unless you're going into academia and you're going to continue that line of research, um, I would think of a PhD as a, a you know, basically a stamp that you can do scientific research um, and um, you would be marketable with those skill sets. So there's a question about um, how did I move from a bio, from a chemical engineering background that is kind of associated with um, things like um, transport phenomena and reactor design to something that's biomaterial science and tissue engineering. Um, so so I obviously did my first research um, in involved in 
tissue engineering right off the bat. I actually um, was in a chemical engineering lab that did tissue engineering work. Um, there's a lot of things in chemical engineering that is applicable to many different fields, including tissue engineering. For example, being able to, um, you know, being able to understand mass transport is a very important thing for tissue engineering. Being able to understand reactor design is actually important for tissue engineering, and um, um, and being able to understand materials it's very important. So there's a lot of things that are um, important in uh, tissue engineering and other biomedical fields that are very much related to different engineering disciplines. And um, so I, I think it's actually a very good um, background for people who want to go into this field. Um, so there's a question, why, why paper and science is more important than knowledge? Well, I think, you know, that's because you can write the paper in your CV and it's hard to write the knowledge in your CV. So, so at the end of the day, when people judge how successful people have been, they look for what they've accomplished. And accomplishment means you have to have added new knowledge to the world. And that's typically in the form of a paper. Whereas, you know, potentially you can go on the internet and there's all kinds of um, information and um, stuff in there, but, you know, you don't give um, necessarily, um, you know, new knowledge through adding um, just kind of what's already known to the internet, right? So you have to develop new things and, and that is what a scientific paper should ideally be about. So it's viewed as a, as a higher state when you're contributing to knowledge than actually just um, knowing it. Um, there's a question about writing a um, review paper. What's the advice on getting organized? So I think, you know, it's uh, for writing review papers um, and doing them efficiently, um, really understanding what you're trying to do, what is the review paper that you're going to do, how will you understand that field, you know, being able to synthesize a field um, and um, is really important. So a lot of times people just go around different papers and write a few sentences from each paper and then they just attach it to each other. Uh, but I think really good review papers actually um basically synthesize a whole field you know they go through and understand where the gaps are where the you know the, the future areas of um, interest are those are the kind of papers that are really forward looking and people view them um, really strongly i think um, to stay organized there's definitely lots of tools um, you can um, create a lot of subsections and then try to categorize things in different subsections but really good review papers should go even beyond um, this kind of organization to look really forward, um, futuristic. Um, how do I ask the right question, given that there is limited budget and time? Um, what would be helpful to lead us to the right hypothesis question and data? So I think um, I would say that if one wants to um, think about what is the right question. A right question is one that is going to be a important. It's going to have impact. Um, if you solve it, people are going to care. Um, and then ideally, it should be something that you can actually solve. Um, so you have um, a skill set, resources, um, and um, capabilities to be able to solve it. So it's balancing those two things that is, I think, going to make something the right question. You know, you can ask really important questions to which you will never be able to find answers, or you can um, ask um, really uh, non-important questions that you can easily solve. In both of those cases, you're not going to have much interest from people. Um, but if you actually um, start solving important questions that you can solve, then I think that's the, you know, the kind of questions that you should be asking. Um, So as an advisor, which position of the advisor is basically best on a paper? Um, being corresponding author or um, second or second last? How do labs in the US perceive this? Um, 
uh, especially for so so I think for advisors again like typically corresponding author you know in the U.S. you know they usually go to the end of the paper um, in some other places they like to be in a different thing so it's also field dependent as well um, but again I would just say uh, make the pie so big that it almost doesn't matter where you are on, on papers because you're going to have so many great body of work that speaks for itself. Um, so some thoughts about application of systems biology and tissue engineering. Obviously, it's going to be very important because we have to um, use the you know the knowledge from um, systems level um, behaviors to understand um, a lot about the biology that's going to be needed to make tissues. So I think there's a lot of um, important things that systems biology and um, really understanding biology is going to contribute to this field. Um, Let's go to the next question. So my so the question is, what is my main expectation from my um, people that I work with, like students and postdocs? Um, where is the place of publication amongst other criteria, um, like learning new skills and being an efficient member, interaction with team, nurturing your researcher, writing a research proposal for external funds? So, so to me, um, it's 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 really like you know good let's say a postdoc needs to be able to do a lot of different things is um, needs to be able to work in teams and be able to write papers and all that stuff so it's um you can't really say oh you, you just need one or two of the different skill sets or oh, if someone is just interacts with other people um and is a nice person um then they're a really good researcher. I think, you know, you need to really be able to do all of it. You need to be able to um, have the final publications and be able to finish the publications, but at the same time, be able to work in teams and come up with important questions and um, be able to do work, um, um, have new skill sets that you add all the time. The good postdocs can do all of that. Um, and, um, and really, it's not about paper or not. It's at the end about good people um, rise to the top, right? So you have to just be one of the really good people. And there's times that I've had people who um, at certain point in their postdoc, they said, oh, I'm really worried that I'm not gonna be successful. And I'm like, listen, don't worry, you're gonna be publishing plenty of papers um, at the end of the day, because you're gonna be um, you're on the path for doing that. So so I think it's really, um, um, it's, it's not about papers, but if you're doing everything else properly, then the papers will come. So there's a little bit of a, other questions, and I'm going to maybe skip some of these questions until we get to questions um, that may be more related to the topic of the um, um, stuff today, which is about really um, skills of, for efficiency and kind of um, working in the lab. Um, so there's questions here that I think are very relevant. I just don't think this is the right forum for it. So there's a question about, tell me um, uh, my postdoc experience um, and some of the recipe for management and uh, scheduling, um, weekly schedule for the PhD or postdoc. So, uh, so, so I didn't really do a postdoc. I just spent a few months extra in the lab that I did a PhD and um, already had my faculty position. So um, I didn't really do a postdoc, but um, obviously, I've had lots of experience kind of mentoring postdocs and, um, and PhD students. And I think, um, so first of all, like managing your time um, is uh, very important. So I would say, um, again, protecting one's time and then being able to just spend then enough time to get things done at the place that you want to be like, you know, you get 95% of the quality with 50% of the effort, right? So, so if you get the 95% over and over and over um, and save lots of extra time, then, you know, then you can potentially go back and try to um, work on the ones that are more important. So I think, um, but not having infinite time for things, I think it's really uh, important and really pushing yourself to continuously to do more and more, accomplish more and more, finish 
more and more things because again, finishing is what matters at the end of the day, not working on things. So, um, so those, those are some general advice. Um, so I'm gonna skip some other questions. So again, some philosophical questions like, should the quantity of the publication be the ultimate goal or inherent quest for discovery that may result in fewer publications but has the potential to result in a breakthrough? Obviously, um, you know, breakthrough and um, impact are the ultimate things. Um, so it's never about the number of publications, but it is, um, you know, if you're kind of in the quest for discovery and you have no papers and um, then, but you, you say I'm a zealot and I've been a monk for past 10 years and I've been really focusing on, you know, thing, but I don't have anything to show for it. Then that could be a pretty risky, um, thing because then you, you know, the person could say, listen, I just don't believe you got what it takes to be a successful scientist. So you need to balance, you need to um, have as many great publications as possible, um, but you need to have them because if you just kind of on a quest for discovery um, and have nothing to show for it, then that's a very risky proposition. So, so I think you need, to, um, you need to try to have a balance between um, um, having um, every, obviously you wanna have everything be a top-notch paper, um, but, uh, but if you just kind of, um, you know, just kind of go around and not finish things, then that becomes um, risky. Um, so there's a question again, but uh, I'll answer this one because it's about skill sets and stuff. Um, how do you increase the number of collaborative papers? Um, um, which basically by being able to provide skill sets to other people. So, so I think, you know, one of the things is um, if you want to be on a lot of papers, it's basically, it's, it's good to not try to be on a lot of papers, just be a good person, be a nice lab member and not get upset if you're not on a paper that you think you should be on. So if you're doing that, you should um, typically be, you know, people like to kind of work with people who are nice and who are not bossy and demand things. So if you want to be on a lot of collaborative papers, just um, try to help, but don't ask for anything. And then just by, you know, um, by people really valuing that, then you get to be on more papers. That's been my experience. Whereas a lot of times, if it's just becomes too much of, you know, uh, I go before this person, that person goes before this other person, then it's not really um, it's not really going to lead to as many long term kind of successes. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, long term successes I've had are because people have had good interactions working with me on publications, and then they um, come back and wanted to do it again. So I think you know, thinking about people ahead of the paper is is one of my general advice on that. Um, so there's a question about what's the idea and suggestions about substitution of an in vivo test in papers because of budget restrictions. So I, I would say um, you typically, um, if you have a type of work that requires in vivo experiments, then you probably um, should try to have that in vivo experiments because it's really about um, the impact of the work at the end of the day. And um, if you don't have that, critical data, people are not going to think that it's as impactful. So, so that's um, just general thing. I think we really need to kind of um, think about that. Um, so there's a question about uh, what's more efficient, lots of skills with average qualification or mastering a few skills. Um, I think that's both interesting. Like I would say definitely mastering um, important skills like how to be efficient um, is better than having average skills at some, some things like that, like how to work in teams. You know, if you know really a master of how to be efficient and work in teams and, you know, um, ask big questions, then that's probably all the skills you need, right? So then you can kind of surround yourself with other people who can have lots of qualifications for different things. So really, I think mastering a few things that you can 
contribute um, really strongly, I think is important. Uh, but you definitely should not be incompetent in other aspects, you know, so having um, average skills and other things is important, but, you know, you really want to be a master of um, really important skills. Um, so maybe, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I have to jump off. I have another important meeting in two minutes. So, but this has been really um, exciting. Unfortunately, we still have lots of questions that we didn't get to. But um, as you've seen, we've been doing these fireside chats more frequently. So come by and we look forward to uh, having some other nice questions at um, the next one next week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.